Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing autoimmune hemolytic anemias, a very high yield topic for step one, uh, something you should definitely be aware of and definitely know what's happening, at least to a certain extent. If you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine, you can find our complete hematology oncology playlist for step one, where we cover practically all the topics you need to know for step one in depth, uh, and it lets you refresh your memory. Now, while you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel because just support definitely means a lot to us. So with that being said, let's talk about normocytic anemias because autoimmune hemolytic anemias are a subtype or a type of normocytic anemias. Now normocytic anemias are anemias that cl are classified by an MCV that is normal, 80 to 100. So if you have a mean corpuscular vo uh, volume of 80 to 100, that means you have a normal red blood, blood cell volume. And uh, practically, pretty much that's, that's pointing you towards normocytic anemia. Now, these can be subdivided based off of hemolysis, and you have non-hemolytic anemias and hemolytic anemias, and within the hemolytic anemias, you have intrinsic causes and extrinsic causes, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Now, um, it's really important to understand that the intrinsic causes of hemolysis occur because of problems within the cell. That is the main reason. So this can be enzyme or membrane defects. Um, you could also have issues with hemoglobin. So hemoglobinopathies can also lead to intrinsic causes of hemolysis. Now, all of these, these topics we have completed on our channel. We have gone through them, so you can watch videos about uh, these intrinsic causes. Now, when it comes to extrinsic causes, these are issues that occur outside of the cell with Within the vasculature and um, it, this is going to be autoimmune hemolytic anemias that's what we're talking about today but you can also have micro and macro angiopathic hemolytic anemias as well as infections all these three we're going to cover in our subsequent videos so for today we're going to focus on autoimmune hemolytic anemia one thing to understand is a reticulocyte count is going to be raised it's going to be about it's going to be greater than two percent normal is usually one to two percent right so this is going to be greater than two percent the reason why is your bone marrow realizes that you have lysing of the red blood cells and because you have lysing you have a decreased amount of red blood cells along with decreased haptoglobin because hemoglobin is being released etc etc your body ramps up production of the red blood cells in the bone marrow and that ramping up means that more reticulocytes are going to be released accidentally with immature red blood cells you have immature red blood cells being released that whole process leads to an increase increase in the reticulocyte count, something that you will only see in hemolytic anemias, whether they are uh, extrinsic or intrinsic hemolytic anemias. You're not going to see that in non-hemolytic normocytic anemias because you're not really lysing red blood cells. So let's talk about uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemias. These are autoimmune mediated hemolytic anemias, as the name states. That means you can have antibody mediated hemolysis. That is the main uh, uh, pathogenesis that's occurring. This can be either IgG and IgM, and this is really important to remember because uh, of the type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia you can get based off of the predominant concentration of the antibody, which we're going to talk about in a second. All of this is going to happen extravascularly, so this is all going to be extravascular hemolysis, and this is a type 2 hypersensitivity, okay, this is a, uh, um, a cytotoxic uh, mediated hypersensitivity, that's one thing to understand. The IgG and IgM can coat the, uh, the, the red blood cells, and when they coat the red blood cells, macrophages will then engulf and destroy the red blood cells, so keep that in mind. Now, the peak incidence usually occurs in patients who are 50 to 80 years old, and this is idiopathic. We don't really know what happens. So with some of them we do know, for example, with cold IgG, sorry, IgM-mediated uh, hemoglobinopathy, uh, sorry, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, you, we do know that certain bacteria can cause it, like mycoplasma, pneumonia can lead to a cold uh, I, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. But we really don't know what is causing all these uh, these hemolytic anemias. There are two main subtypes, and I touched up about that a little bit. Um, it's going to be based off of the antibody itself. So if you have predominantly IgG, you're going to have a warm uh, hemolytic anemias. And if you have predominantly IgM, you're going to have a cold hemolytic anemia. So let's just write that here. We're going to talk more about that right now. So when it comes to warm 
autoimmune hemolytic anemia, right? I have a fire right here to remind you that this is a warm hemolytic anemia. You are going to see more IgG deposition, and that is pretty much the main hallmark of this type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You're going to have an increase in IgG production. You can have an increase in IgG-mediated hemolysis as well. RBCs are going to react at body temperature, right? Because our body temperature is pretty high. And because of that reason, your red blood cells will react at body temperature. And uh, that's exactly the whole reasoning why we, wrote, we, we consider this to be warm. This is a chronic condition. And it's more common than uh, other types of autoimmune hemolytic anemias like IgM. It's associated with lupus, with uh, CLL. Uh, and alpha methodopa drugs can definitely cause uh, a warm hemolytic anemia. This triggers the production auto alpha methodopa uh, triggers the production of the red blood cell antibody uh, binding. Penicillin can also lead to a warm uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And for the purposes of boards, you need to know that the penicillin attaches uh, to the red blood cell membrane and causes the antibodies to bind to the red blood cell at high doses. So the two drugs that can lead to a warm hemolytic anemia, all right, other than lupus and all the autoimmune mediated you know, uh, issues that you can have like cancers, et cetera, et cetera, the two things you need to know for warm Let's just write this out right here. Warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is going to be alpha methyl dopa, okay, and penicillin. All right, now let's move on to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Again, we have a photo of uh, snow. This is cold stuff, so it should remind you it's cold. And this is all mediated by IgM. Uh, the red blood cells inactivate complement, but the C3B, C3B portion of complement actually serves as an opsonin in the spleen. Okay, And when this happens, in extreme cases, it can lead to intravascular hemolysis as well. Now, red blood cells are going to end up reacting in this type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia in cold temperatures. That's the other uh, portion that you need to know. In warm hemolytic anemias, they react in warm temperatures like our body temperature because our body temperature is warm. And in cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it's going to happen in colder temperatures. You can see this anemia happen in the cold, right? So if someone goes out into the snow or into a cold area, you're going to realize, you know, uh, there's some sort of hemolysis happening because when they pee, then their urine might be red, right? Some sort of signs they may become exhausted because they're having hemolysis. They may be anemic. And usually this is an acute condition and it is complement mediated. We talked about that earlier. Right, the red blood cells are inactivating complement, but because you still have three C3B uh, floating around, it's going to serve as an opsonin in the spleen, and along with IgM, the splenic macrophages can destroy red blood cells while this is happening. This is going to be associated with CLL again. Right, you can have uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is very high yield for boards because this is one of the only few uh, bacteria that cause it and in fact for the board this is the only thing you need to know about a uh, warm a cold I, a cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia that it is mediated often by mycoplasma pneumonia if you have mycoplasma pneumonia you should understand that the, you may see cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia this is because mycoplasma pneumonia has IgM cold agglutination that occurs Infectious mononucleosis can also cause this, mono based off of EBV or CMV. But you want to associate this more with mycoplasma pneumonia. So let's write this right here. Cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This is mainly going to be uh, associated with mycoplasma, mycoplasma pneumonia. All right, perfect. Now, let's talk about this classic presentation of a patient who presents with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It's going to be a 57-year-old woman. It can be a male, but they're going to complain that ever since the temperature dropped, right, ever since it, the, the temperature dropped, they've developed painful, numb blue fingers and toes, right? Uh, and that should clue you in right away. This is so straightforward, so easy. It should clue you into what type of hemolytic anemia? 
cold, right? Because the temperature has dropped and you're noticing that they have painful, numb, blue fingers and toes, their extremities. Obviously, our extremities are normally colder than our uh, the you know the center of our body the torso and that means you're gonna have uh, a more likelihood of cold agglutination and cold hemolytic anemia occurring around the extremities rather than anywhere else now obviously they they're gonna say that this is all uh, goes back to normal all these things go back to normal and they go inside and it happens every time her fingers and toes are cold a few weeks ago she felt fatigue and had a long cold with sore throat and lymph nodes what's happening what is this presentation indicative of well it's gonna be mycoplasma pneumonia okay uh, because she is describing a typical walking pneumonia physical exam is going to show splenomegaly and mild jaundice because remember this is all happening extravascularly the IgM and C3B are going to coat the red blood cell when they get to the spleen the splenic macrophages are going to destroy the red blood cells leading to splenomegaly as well as mild jaundice because you are increasing the amount of hemoglobin and bilirubin that is circulating especially the uh, uh, indirect bilirubin because it hasn't been conjugated yet. Your analysis is going to be positive for hemoglobin urea and hemosiderin urea and peripheral blood smear is going to show spherocytosis. Spherocytes are also going to be present. So that should clue you in. All of this should clue you in to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia which is IgM mediated. Now, when it comes to boards, they may not write cold. They may write IgM-mediated hemolytic anemia. They may just write autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You just need to know what is happening and what is the infectious agent that is leading to this type of hemolytic anemia, and that is mycoplasma pneumonia. She had a walking pneumonia, and now she's presenting with signs of cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Now, one thing that is very high yield for boards, especially when it comes to autoimmune disorders and how to autoimmune hemolytic anemia specifically, is the Coombs test. The Coombs test is a test used to evaluate autoimmune hemolytic anemias. Now, this can be subdivided based off of two types. You have the direct Coombs test and you have the indirect Coombs test. So let's talk about these two before we move forward. Let's talk about the direct Coombs test first because this is the easiest one to understand and it's pretty straightforward. In the direct Coombs test, what I like to think about is that you directly put the patient's okay, patient's serum. And in the patient's serum, you're going to have the red blood cells and any antibodies that they may have. Okay, That is the main thing. You're looking to see if they have any autoimmune antibodies, especially to the red blood cells. right? So you get the patient's serum, and then you're going to add the Coombs reagent. Okay. And Coombs reagent is pretty much uh, a antibody antibody. Okay, it's an antibody to this antibody right here. And if you have a positive Coombs test, okay, you are going to have agglutination. That is what is happening. The red blood cells and the antibodies that are coating the red blood cells are going to bind to the Coombs reagent and it's going to lead to agglutination. That is a direct Coombs test. You are directly putting the patient's serum into uh, the Coombs reagent and that is going to lead to uh, agglutination. In the indirect Coombs test, you are not going to put the patient's serum completely. You're only going to put patient's okay, antibodies. That's it. Antibodies are only going to go in. You're going to put in uh, along with donor red blood cells and uh, RBA antibodies if they have any. So donor serum pretty much. That is what you're adding if there are any antibodies. And if you see a positive indirect Coombs, okay, it's going to be the same. You're going to see agglutination. And that just means that you have uh, a positive indirect Coombs test occurring. Coombs test is going to let you know if there is an antibody 
to the red blood cells in a patient's serum. You can use the patient's serum directly or you can isolate those antibodies or the immunoglobins that are in the serum to see if there are antibodies to red blood cells. Because if you use the indirect Coombs test, the patient's antibodies in their serum that have been isolated will still bind to donor red blood cells. Okay, and one thing to understand is this antibody in the indirect Coombs test is going to be the Coombs reagent. Okay, it's not like it's just random antibodies. No, this is the Coombs reagent. So the Coombs reagent is always going to be used. You just don't know if it's going to be used with the patient's red blood cells or with donor red blood cells. Now, that is exactly what you need to know for autoimmune hemolytic anemias. Of course, they have these antibodies, and these patients are going to be uh, positive for the direct Coombs test, and they're going to show positive results for the indirect Coombs test, simply based off of the fact that the, they have these antibodies. Now, let's just review really quickly when it comes to the autoimmune hemolytic uh, anemia diagnosis. How are you going to diagnose this? For the, uh, for the warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias, you're going to see a positive uh, direct Coombs test with anti-IgG reagent. And with the cold autoimmune hemolytic anemias, you're going to see a positive direct Coombs test with the anti-C3 reagent. That is important. It is anti-C3 and anti-IgG. Okay, that is important. The indirect Coombs test is also going to be positive uh, for warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias, but not for cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That is very important. I think this is pretty high yield because a lot of people get confused when they see a positive indirect Coombs test. No, the reason why is you don't have antibodies uh, uh, in this in this in this test to IgM. This is not an IgM uh, antibody. No, this is an antibody to C3. So your, your uh, indirect Coombs test is going to be negative. And it is not performed, like we said, with IgM antibodies. The red blood cells are going to spontaneously agglutinate at room temperature in warm hemolytic anemia because they are more uh, uh, used to getting agglutinated in warmer temperatures. But in cold, they will not agglutinate. They have to be titered. And uh, you'll see more agglutination occurring in colder temperatures. And you're going to see normal complement levels in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias, whereas you're going to see a decreased levels of C3 and C4 because the red blood cells are inactivating the complement activity like we said earlier in cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Now when it comes to treatment for the warm uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, you can do uh, a, a few things. You can, you can stop the offending drugs. So if you're giving them penicillin or alpha methyl dopa, you can just stop using that drug. That treats the issue right then and there. You can give them steroids to reduce IgG production, but just understand that by giving steroids, you're putting them at risk of infections, uh, especially with decreased IgG productions. You can give IVIG, and that's really cool because when you give IVIG, it works in a very, very uh, interesting fashion. It causes the splenic macrophages to attack the IVIG instead of the RBC I, uh, IgG um, uh, antibody complex, right? So pretty much you still have... Uh, the red blood cells that are binding or those that are being bound by the anti-red blood cell IgG, that complex is still present. And that doesn't mean that the hemolytic anemia is, is done. If a macrophage, if a splenic macrophage gets exposed to this red blood cell in the uh, spleen, you're still going to have hemolysis. But because you are giving IVIG, they actually see the IVIG and they say, yo, I got to get that stuff right there. I got to go for that. They go for the IVIG, and that lets the red blood cells that are coated in the anti-red blood cell IgG uh, bypass the splenic macrophages and still flow normally in circulation. And that's going to reduce the amount of hemoly hemolysis occurring in the spleen. And finally, you can also do a splenectomy. And obviously, you guys should know the associations with a splenectomy. You're going to have howl jolly bodies as well as increased uh, uh, infections and susceptibility to infections to, to bacteria that are encapsulated. And when it comes to cold autoimmune hemolytic anemias, you got to keep the extremities warm, guys. Like You should know that. That's straightforward. That's where the hemolysis starts occurring on the extremities. you got to keep those extremities warm. And supportive therapy with folate for the anemia. That's pretty much all you can do. You can also give rituximab, which is a CD20 uh, monoclonal antibody. You're attacking the B cells. And by attacking the B cells, you're going to cause a decrease in uh, the production of IgM. 
Also, that's dangerous because you are giving them a monoclonal antibody against a uh, uh, white blood cell, leading them to be susceptible to infections as well with this drug. Now, with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. You can follow us on Instagram at mad.medicine, on Twitter at it's mad medicine. And if you guys don't know, you can also listen to these podcasts on our podcast. Uh, just search for Mad Medicine and we'll pop up. Thank you.